hi, I'm here today with Naomi Mezzi and Steve Metcalf. Hello to both of you. Hi. Hey. Hi, Al. Um, we're here to talk about a poem called A Last Word, which is kind of literally the la at least the last verse word of Robert Mezzi, uh, Bob Mezzi, the poet who is, was Naomi's dad and who has passed away. And this, I guess, was the last poem he wrote before his death. Is that correct? Um, I don't actually know if it was the last poem he wrote before his death. It is the last poem that he had in a manuscript that he mm -hmm. left that was, so it's an unpublished manuscript. Yeah. And he put this as the last poem in that manuscript. So it's like a coda. It's a coda. Uh, he, he clearly put it there mm -hmm. as the last word. He, would you would you mind reading it for us and then we'll talk about it for a minute? I would not, I would not at all. A last word. We are coming to the end. Poems that resemble wild dogs tamed at great cost and made to tremble obediently at my side have now regressed. They want new masters, those who know dogs best. There is a sound of someone breathing. Sun falls like a thought behind a mountain's brow. The old life over, the new life unbegun and nothing more to say, at least for now. I'd like to ask both of you if you would start by commenting on the phrase, nothing more to say, which is of course an intentional paradox because he is having a say. Steve, you first, it's a powerful phrase, nothing more to say. What do you think? Well, what's funny about it also, Al, is that it's just immediately qualified, right? Yeah. It's such a definitive, taken alone, it's so definitive for a poem that's a coda to a life's work and a life. Right. Right? And then immediately there's, you know, at least for now. Mm. So it closes off and then just opens up right away. But the, the closing off seems, Naomi, so much more definitive than the opening up, you know? Yeah. Nothing more to, if the poem ended with nothing more to say, you'd know exactly what that meant definitive silence of that period done. But at least for now is very equivocal uh, and open. Naomi, at least for now suggests either a belief in some kind of voice that comes from beyond death or um, the power of poetry to keep talking to us. Probably both of those things. Well, are I, I would say for my father, those were one and the same thing. The only voice that came to you from the place after death was the poetry you were able to write in this life. And so I think it's partly about the extent to which his voice, the poems he wrote, will survive him and keep speaking. And yeah. I think the, the, the interesting thing about the paradox, you note, Al, the nothing left to say is, of course, saying something. Yeah. is a kind of um, this mirroring of form or style with propositional content that he admired in other poets and loved to do himself. In mm -hmm. fact, I think the whole first verse is some version of that. Yeah. Let me ask both of you a follow-up to that then. Um, what was it like? I mean, this is uh, – and, and uh, Steve knew Bob as well, of course, as a longtime friend of you and presumably of your family as well. But um, I'll start with you, Naomi, and you can take this as a personal question if you want. What was it like, what's it like to have a parent who upon the verge of departure uh, says something final? All, all of our parents say something more or less final, um, unless, unless death is a very sudden thing. But in this case, you have a formality, you have you have the thing that said likened to a dog tamed at great cost, wild dog. And that cost as, as daughter reader, and also, you know, intellectual yourself, a professor of law and so forth. Can you talk about that great cost? What, what did it cost him? What does it cost you to tame wild thoughts into rhymed, metered poetry 
huge question. It was very disarmingly asked, but it's a huge question. It is a huge question. Um, what was the cost for him of taming wild language <laughs> into obedient verse? Um, I think it was um, this uh, sense of uh, tremendous conflict between something that felt like a vocation for him. Poetry was not something that he ever felt he had a choice about. And so it was both a duty, a calling, but it was also a love and, and like something that he felt himself obedient to. And I think there, he had a tremendous sense of pressure mm. in the way in which we feel pressure to fulfill our duty to the things and the people that we love. And how, how does, we could have done any of the Robert Nessie poems, but we decided this one. How, how does it feel to be, uh, I mean, he talks about cost and regression there. What, what is that? And I'm gonna to turn to Steve for a second, but I'm really curious as to your thoughts about that. So I mean, you don't have to. <laughs> no, no, no. I, you know, so I think the cost and the regression and the reason why this poem is the last poem, this manuscript is entitled To a Gathering Vacancy. And I didn't think that much about, I mean, that title is haunting, um, but I didn't think all that much about it. I just assumed as because I knew that he was he had this manuscript and was endlessly tinkering with it. And I always assumed it meant death. He spent his entire life preoccupied and deeply afraid of death. Mm. Um, but it occurs to me, actually, now <laughs> that you asked that question, that the vacancy that was gathering was, of course, death, but it was also the sort of um, smaller deaths that occur along the way, the shutting down of mind and memory that was happening progressively for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and he had in his prime thousand, literally thousands of poems memorized. Mm -hmm. um, and he began to lose them. And, and in some ways that even more than being unable to write them felt like an enormous loss and cost to him. And I, and I makes me think that in some sense, the, the obediency and the regression are his own frustrations with his diminishing power. Wow. That's quite a response. Um, thank you, Steve. I, I want to ask you, to comment on the new masters. Um, at the end of that powerful first stanza, he, and this follows from what Naomi just said, he realizes that the poem ideas, the wild poem ideas that he's been able to tame at great cost and that he can't anymore, will need new new masters, new people, new people and new voices and new ideas to tame them. That is of course the history of poetry. That is the course, of course what art is, an artist gives way. Anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the idea that these poem ideas need new masters after the first master passes from the scene. Right. I mean, there's the, uh, I'll correct me if I'm wrong, but there's the Renaissance tradition of go little book, you know, yes. Yes. where that moment comes where it's no longer yours at all. And you, as the author, you relinquish it. And in some ways, your claim upon it as it goes forth into the world is the, is the most tenuous or... In some at least at least authoritative, it just becomes its reception in the world. And there's to make that gesture not only in the you know span of this very small poem, but retrospectively to all of your work is kind of amazing. But the thing that Naomi, I'd love to hear you talk about this a little bit. The thing that blows me away about this poem is that you know, when something the relationship between wildness and being tamed in this poem is so equivocal. 
And in fact, if you really examine it evocatively weird in a way that makes the poem very powerful to me because you've taken these wild dogs, presumably a kind of fearsome beast, and you've tamed them at enormous cost not only to you, but to the dog, because it trembles obediently. Like obedience is a very, very, you know, amb ambivalent virtue in this poem. And then they're regressing, which suggests that they're going back to a state of kind of fearsomeness or wildness, at least to the poet who's losing them, but they're, they're gonna get new masters, those who know dogs best, and he's sort of, it is that relinquishment, right? Some, somebody is gonna know this, the odd, the odd thing about being a creator is the enormous blindness out of which you created the thing that you made that is somehow weirdly perspicuous to people who didn't go through the enormous cost of creating it. And so it's not just that he's giving it over, he's to those who know dogs best, it's, it's like there's gonna be a new and completely authoritative way of experiencing this. The, and the relationship of that to what I did to make it is is not a, symmetrical one, right? Or am I, am I, no I, no, I think you've actually hit on something really interesting, Steve. And while you were talking, it made me realize, yeah, the, the, the wildness and the obedience are equivocal. And in some ways they encapsulate the major equivocation of his entire life in relationship to poetry, which was his internal conflict between free verse and form, formal poetry, right? And in fact, the taming is, is so much about what it takes to tame language into formal verse, metered and rhymed verse. And, you know, so, and he more than most people really went 180 degrees from naked poetry early on in his career and championing the free verse movement to a complete return to the importance of formalism and the, the, the arts actually of taming. Yeah. And I think in some sense, there's a remaining tension between those two passions of his mm -hmm. and that were always a point of internal conflict but it's always the new masters are also i you know especially toward the end of his life i think he felt very forlorn about the state of formal verse and the number of poets remaining who knew how to write it well and i think those new masters is a giving up to mm. the the course of poetry itself, not just this poem. We have, to, we, we have to wrap up soon, but I want to ask two more questions and maybe the two of you can decide who wants to deal with each question. I'll tell you what both questions are and then you can go from there. The, the first question has to do with the first line of the second stanza, which is for me the most beautiful and ominous. There is a sound of someone breathing. <laughs> passively constructed and it's so bodily but anyway that I'm, I'm curious to know what either of you thinks about that and then of course the other one will take the title the last word uh which has you know a bunch of important meanings all at once so who wants to take which <laughs> you pick, i named uh, one of those two i'll i'll start with the first um, there is a sound of someone breathing is, is one of the lines in that poem that I keep going back to because it is the, in some sense, it's, it's like the performative quality of loss <laughs> is like the memory of the most quintessential act of being alive. Mm. And it's also a kind of, it, it just has this haunting quality as if, you know, the death has come, the embodiment of death has come. Yeah. And, and he hears it. Yes. And breath is so associated with making poetry, making music, oh, yeah. uh, respiration and aspiration, inspiration. Mm. 
are all spirations. And when you stop breathing, there's no more art. Uh, it's all about sound and music. So it's, it's really a lovely, a lovely thing. Um, and you can't help but think about the dying person uh, hearing the sound of his own breathing, you know. I mean, one wonders that when mortality finally comes very close, you can you hear yourself breathing as if it's somebody else doing that one automated things that thing that bodies do that you can't generally can't stop yourself from doing. Um, Steve, wrap it up with a last word. You get the last word on a last word. Um, I liked the last question. I, I love that. You can do the last question. Well, I, I just add to the you know beautiful things that Naomi said that in the first stanza you get a metaphor, right? And then in the second, you know, metaphor just disappears completely. Well, not completely. I mean, sun falls like a thought behind a mountain. In a simile. Simile, but yeah. behind a mountain's brow. I love that image, sun falls like a thought behind a mountain's brow. It has this almost... Sunset. It, is, it isn't really metaphorical. It's the sunset. Yeah, and it's it isn't a, a sunset. zen-like acceptance of it. But I, I guess the title of the poem is you know, a last word. It's modest, Steve. It's not the last word. A last word. It's, it's, it's almost more like, it's almost less like the logos and more like, oh, can we have a word? Right, <laughs> it has, it, that, it, I like the fact that it, that word is at once portentous and completely Mm. modest and mm. very human yeah. pedestrian yeah yes. pedestrian. steve naomi thank you so much for for doing this and uh naomi i'm sorry for your loss it's uh when did bob pass away april 25th recently okay. very recently yeah thank you so much for having me on al and thank you steve for the very spontaneous um participation well, nobody watching this knows but steve medcalf who's in uh the hudson valley and who's the host of the culture gab fest uh is a friend a, a friend of both of ours and we just recruited him at the last minute and naomi i want to plug your work you're working at the intersections of certain aspects of the law that have to do with gender inequality sometimes and extends to general inequality right Absolutely, yeah. In fact, all of the sort of cultural manifestations of law, legal discourse, and identity and inequality. So thank you for the work that both of you are doing, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks you so much, Al. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, thanks, Naomi. That was great. If you liked this episode, watch another and subscribe. And join us for ModPo, a free and open course at modpo.org.